I suppose being sort of growing up as a child in the early 60s, being brought up in London, he used to come to my parents' house, but I didn't often see him or know who he was. But I was obsessed in those days by this um, television series, a sort of Western, called Rawhide, that had starring Clint Eastwood. And I was so obsessed by it that I was nicknamed Rawhide. And I have this um, letter from him saying, to Rawhide, best wishes Francis Bacon. And so it was quite... So it was very sweet. And I, I mean, so that must have been... God early 60s because he, and people started to stop calling me Rawhide when I was about um, 9 or 10. So, that, so in that sense it was very good that um, he'd known me for all these years, for later on for various things one did. But to be honest, he was probably there and I wasn't really paying attention, but I think that the first time I really had consciousness of him was I was probably about 9 or 10 and they'd been, they were my my parents had this sort of um, cottage in the country, sort of holiday, holiday home, the holiday home that they rented. And there was always lots of drink around. And I just remember Francis being very drunk and talking to me. And then over the years, um, again, he would come to my parents' house, uh, again, in, in the country. And he also, because he's very good friends of um, these artists, Dickie Chopping and Dennis Worth Miller. And my parents' sort of holiday home was in a place called Fingering Ho. And there was a river which divided Fingering Ho from Wivenho, is where they were. And Francis quite often went to stay there and they would come over for lunch. And these lunches went on for, you know, till three or four in the morning. And, um, which was always great fun. I always remembered it, sort of. Um, and so those kind of situations happened. And again, I would probably bump into him at Liverpool Street Station as he's catching a train down to Colchester, I suppose, or even directly to Wivenhoe. And how did your parents know him? Well, I'm not sure. I think, again, probably through um, Dickie and Dennis. I mean, certainly, I was always told this story that he came to see my parents in the early 50s in their house in Primrose Hill with two paintings and said, would they like to buy them? For I think they were like £150 each, but £150 each in the early 50s was a lot of money, and they said no. In Suffolk, there was a place called Hintlesham Hall, which was a restaurant run by Robert Carrier, and Robert Carrier would have exhibitions. In fact, he would have an exhibition of Dennis Worth Miller and lo and behold, Francis would turn up and again, lots of champagne and lots of sort of people passing out on the lawn outside. And um, so it, but he was always very friendly. And I suppose really, it was about 1976, he invited me to go to his exhibition when he was given the freedom of the city of Marseille. And I'd bump into him, say, there was a club in London in, in Covent Garden called Zanzibar and to suddenly turn, turn up late with um, Dennis Worth Miller. Opened a gallery in Dean Street, which is practically underneath the Connery Room. And my first show was on Pop Art, and Francis came in the next day and uh, said, um, wow, you know, this is great. He always liked Richard Hamilton's work. We went for, to the Connery Room, had drinks, then went out for dinner. And then I suddenly said, you know, how would you like to have an exhibition in Moscow? And um, which upon he agreed. Uh, well, I sort of said, listen, let me check the next day, I'll ring you up. And I also had to ring up Moscow. And also, in those days, you couldn't just um, ring up Moscow like that. You had to book a call for five hours before they rang you back. And anyway, the Moscow um, people said, absolutely, that's perfect. And uh, then Francis said, I'd love to. And he, because he had, I think, an exhibition in America and the Americans always quite don't really like Francis Bacon's work, and so to actually to the, he thought, you no, know, to have a show in Moscow is really sort of um, fingers up to the Americans. So that's why he agreed to do it. And I guess from that sort of, I wasn't sort of a fly by night sort of person. It was because of this whole kind of knowing knowing me for so long. It was I wasn't going to. It was a, there was a trust there rather than something sort of um, different. And he certainly had uh, interest in Russian culture. He loved Eisenstein's work, especially Battleship Potemkin, and Strike he liked. Um, and also, I think in the 20s, 19, about 1929, he was taken, I can't remember who took him to Berlin, and where he met some Russian sailors and got on very well with them. Then I needed to get a letter from him, that I, then, which I have, that, saying how much he wanted to have an exhibition. And then I had to sort of kind to write this letter to to Tia Selikov, who was head of the Union of Artists in Moscow. And, um, and that's really, it was quite straightforward. I mean, because they really, they really wanted to have Francis Bacon's work. They, um, lots of artists had known his work from seeing magazines, and where a magazine lasts probably about before it disintegrates, about 2,000 people have seen it. And so they knew his work. And uh, 
they, it was quite extraordinary that um, that was the one artist they would like to have seen from the West. It somehow seems absolutely easy to understand now in a funny way. But yeah, yeah, exactly, but you would think there would something, I don't know, something completely different, but I suppose it, the way his, his paintings are, oh, they're perfect for Russia. Yes, exactly. Um, and there was always talk that he would be going, but then he didn't. That's true. Well, he, he really, really wanted to. And there was sort of, um, I, th I think it, his asthma was sort of taking over and he had a bit of a problem really with that. And even though his doctor said he would um, come with him and take some ox oxygen tanks, but he was a little bit nervous and he was getting on really. And um, anyway, John Edwards went in instead of him. Um, but when I went to pick up John Edwards on the way to the airport, um, I dropped off and, and um, Francis cooked us both um, eggs and bacon for to have a safe journey on our way. So um, that was quite sweet. And uh, yeah, but he, and he had his bags packed and he had been learning Russian on a cassette. So he really, really wanted to go. And he also wanted to go, not only to go to Moscow and for his exhibition. I mean, I think what put him off was all the sort of the pomp and circumstance he had to do with like meeting a British ambassador or having tea with so and so. And basically what he wanted to do was go to the, maybe the, um, Pushkin um, Museum, and then really wanted to go to um, Leningrad in those days, St. Petersburg, to see the Hermitage and see all these amazing pictures that had been, hadn't been seen in the West for years. Yeah, and yes, that's rather sort of poignant that he had his bags packed somehow. Um, well, in fact, the sad thing is, if I'd known, and I didn't know, that because he was such an important figure, I could have got him on the plane and he could have arrived in Moscow and they would have got him a visa like that. Um, but I had no idea. I thought you have to have a visa. If you don't have a visa, you, you're sort of trapped. But he was that important that he could have done that. And I think he would have been slightly nervous too, to arrive in a country without a visa. I mean, I, mean, I think he was, quite, he was quite apprehensive about Russia. There was sort of rumours of people being kidnapped and all that sort of stuff, which didn't really exist. It was just sort of opening up and, and there was no way they were going to touch a, um, a foreigner in any possible way. Yeah, that's interesting. Did you find him to be so adventurous, or was he already a bit, as you say, a bit old by then, a bit more timid? I think a bit more timid. I think, but he, you know, he was still, you know, incredibly youthful um, mentally, and 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 I think if he didn't have asthma, he would be, you know, he'd be going everywhere possible. And you know, if he stayed up pretty late for his age, and you know, a lot of people, even what did they say, he was in the his eighties, um, were um, you know, by the time they were sixty, they're in bed by sort of nine o'clock. <laughs> That's some people we know. <laughs> and then through Francis, I met John, and I really liked John. I thought he was a quite an extraordinary character and very funny. You know, I'd go and stay in uh, John's farm, and Francis would come down, and Ian Board, who was the bartender of the colony room, um, would be the sort of, sort of the maid. And he was a completely different character from other swearing abuse from behind the bar. He was like, you know, would you like some more roast beef? Or, or you know, would you like some more potatoes? And there's this vast sort of piece of roast beef that after having so much to drink that hardly anything was eaten and it was sort of chucked out the next day. People would just sort of come over and it would be just endless drinking. That's basically as far as I can remember. And some people sort of collapsed and some people sort of disappeared and that was about it. I first became conscious of his work. I think my parents said, "Listen, you, you know, this, this Francis Bacon is really kind of some, quite like well, they they described it as what the papers describe it as nightmarish." And in um, Primrose Hill, where I was brought up, there was a little bookshop, and it had I think it was about 1971, 72. This first big book that had come out, not the catalogue resume, but a big book on Francis Bacon's works. And I suppose I would have been 12, 13. And did you look at it like, this is my parents' friend, or...? Uh, no, I just looked at it completely different. I thought, wow, this is really quite fascinating. And then, of course, then there's a connection, so there was just... But one didn't think about it like that. It was a sort of... It was, yeah, that's very interesting. Well, that's an interesting question, you should say that. It was, I thought it completely differently. It was, like, detached, in a sense. Which mm -hmm. is... In, the, 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 to see his work and know he was a friend of my parents. It is... Because I've always thought that if Francis Bacon wasn't a painter, what would he be? Because it... Initially, you don't see it well, the way he is. You don't think of him as a painter. He's sort of, he could be, uh, he could be an actor. He could be, um, I don't interior designer, but not a painter, and not a painter of what he was capable of doing, which is unbelievable stuff. So that's, yes, so that's... Um, what would you imagine the person who painted those paintings to be like? Well, 
I can't, I, you, you don't know, it's just difficult to say, but I mean, he didn't, he never wanted to talk about art. I mean, the, I think that, you know, over the years one talked about, he, I mean, he did tell me at those times in Zanzibar how much he loved the Surrealists and certainly liked Christian Tsar, or the Tsarist. Um, but otherwise, I think one time, over the course of many meals, someone, someone brought up art and uh, he said, oh God, that dreary subject. <laughs> and so it wasn't discussed. He was the first artist to be shown in, in Russia with international standards. So therefore, you know, if you think of that, about Abramovich, why did he buy Francis Bacon? It's, is that because Bacon first showed in Moscow? Who knows? I mean, that's, that's an idea. Um, you could also say uh, at that time that, okay, things were um, kind of, the, the whole Soviet Union was collapsing. Okay, so to show Francis Bacon, who was well-known homosexual, in, and to show that, which was, you know, homosexuality in, in, in Russia, you could get, you know, 25 years in the gulag. So there was all that happening. So in that sense, it was a rather amazing time. And I think, uh, so I think he was pleased with it. I think also, I think it changed a lot of attitudes in Russia. And I think, so therefore, the whole thing is perfect. I think it's absolutely really an important exhibition. I quite agree for all those reasons. And um, I remember hearing that people used to stand in front of each painting for hours on end. Well, that, see, that's what changed my life. I found it so fascinating going back the next day and suddenly seeing somebody looking at one of his pictures and staying there for two or three hours, just absorbing one picture, when here, you know, people sort of like shoot past within um, five seconds. So I realised that this was giving these people who had been starved of Western culture sort of chink of light and I just thought that was incredible and um, that sort of changed my attitude towards art and sort of somehow you know art or sport is a, is a wonderful way to make friendship between countries which are quite you know hostile. I quite agree and did you tell Francis about um, people staring for that long? Oh absolutely and he was delighted really delighted by that. It must be the most marvellous thing mm. to hear really. Exactly, right. and especially considering they were having the American criticism and, um, and sort of people hear him always saying, oh, everybody hates my work. Oh, that's fascinating. And um, so after that, have you got, did, were there any times you particularly remember running into him? Oh, yes. I mean, I used to still see him. Not so much. I mean, in those days, I probably would have dinner with him two or three times a week, sometimes more, sometimes less. And then after the show, I would still um, I would see him. And in fact... Uh, it's one time he invited me around to his studio and uh, he said what had I been doing and I said I'd been in Suffolk that weekend and I said that I'd been invited to this party um, by these people called Pissarro who was, they are related to the, the Impressionists and but they're apple farmers now and I went with two friends and I said to, I can't remember the name of the person, Pissarro, the Christian name, I said I hope you don't mind I brought two friends and uh, he said, well, actually, James, I'm happy to see you, but I'm not happy to see your friends, so do you mind if they um, don't come into the party? I went, this is ridiculous, I'm leaving. Anyway, I told Francis this story. Francis said, the French have always been weird. Basically, after a while, I used to meet in restaurants, but then, and you know, we, we would meet in the White Tower and um, have dinner with Stephen Spender and uh, John Edwards, or I think when Babendum opened up, he rather liked Babendum. And when you had dinner, not sort of exactly what you said, but as you said, nothing about art, but was it all sort of bitching and joking and gossip? Um, some, I mean, he was always, because there was this very funny thing to do with um, Dennis Worth Miller. See, I, he got into his head that um, Dennis Worth Miller had this nickname called um, Nanny Worth Millions, and because he was sort of... I, I, again, it's one of those things which um, my mother always said. She didn't, she, they, they, Dickie and Dennis and Francis used to bath me as a child. And, and uh, everybody <laughs> finds that very bizarre, which I totally agree. Anyway, so, so Francis got it in his head that um, Nanny Worth Millions was my godfather. And so therefore he got sort of rather jealous of this. So he was always bitching about Dennis <laughs> for some reason. It was quite funny. And um, anyway... Um, so he, he would sort of, uh, uh, there'd be that sort of bit of gossip about saying, oh, Dennis rang me up last night and he was on the phone for four hours and said, I'd never speak to me again. And, and then the brother said, I won't. And then, and then he said, well, I won't speak to you either. And there were all that sort of stuff. But then on the other hand, there would be studying unbelievable stories. And you go, wow, this is un incredible. I've got to remember in the morning. Of course, in the morning, you've forgotten them. What about other artists? Or? 
about, it could be, I can't remember, it could be anything. Because in fact, one had the most delicious bottles of wine. I mean, it was sort of, it wasn't, but there was the amount of wine we had. And he was very clever because you'd have your glass and you'd have his glass. And your glass would be, say, half empty, you'd fill it up. And he would just touch his, so it was always half full, his glass. And he, wouldn't, he might take a sip, but one was drinking and he, he wasn't. Did you ever meet um, his last boyfriend? No. No. Um, well, Ho Hoso, no, yeah, I yeah. never met him. And never, did he talk about you? Never? He did. He said to me, uh, he said, um, I was in a taxi with him. He said, I've said, got a new friend. And I said, because I'm, I'm certainly not going to try and imitate um, <laughs> Francis Bacon's accent, which I know people are very good at, but I'm not going to do it. And he said, I have a new friend. I said, okay. And he said, he's called Jose. And I said, okay. Um, he said, do you know anything about him? I said, no. And I said, what's he do? And by chance, um, I met somebody who said about Jose and something in the connection with Francis Bacon. I, ah, I said, okay, Francis mentioned this. And somehow Jose was... Um, I don't know, friendly with somebody called Julia Ernst, who worked for Charles Saatchi. And he, he was, I think he was, he was a merchant banker or banker or something. Anyway, he got to know Julia Ernst, wanting to know, get to Francis, and which he did. And that was it. But, but um, when I said to Francis, I said, I think he I was having an affair with this woman called uh, Julia Ernst. And he went, oh God, I hope I don't get AIDS. One thing I'll, I'll ask you, which is um, Jake Arbutt was going to do the film, wasn't he, the documentary about That's right. but that didn't come to anything. No, because, well, this was the whole thing. Well, again, actually, which is such strange times, if you think about it. It was, um, you know, this was 1980, September 1988 when the Bacon Show happened in Moscow. And um, to try and find somebody to do, do a documentary wasn't easy. It really wasn't easy. You would think people, nowadays, people would jump at a chance of anybody. And then they weren't. Maybe they were scared. I don't know. Um, or maybe it was difficult getting permission. But yes, Jake Arbach did want to do, um, do a programme. But, and it was, but of course, basically, it was, had to, Francis had to go. And that was the trouble. And that's why it came to your thing. Exactly. Yeah. And did you, did you ever see them together with Lucien? Uh, only that time in Marseille, in 1976, when I think um, Lucien took us all out for a beer base in the old port. And um, again, that was um, Francis, Lucien, some girl, Dickie and Dennis, myself and my godmother, Joni de Vere Hunt. And that was it. And we had a great time. When you heard about his death, how did you feel? Well, that was the extraordinary thing. I was in, <coughs> when, when he died, I was in Moscow. and. I don't know how I heard that information, because there was still, this was, what was it, 91, 90, 91, 92, uh, 92. And there was no, you, you could still, it was difficult, you couldn't ring through, even though it had collapsed, you couldn't, there was even worse situation. And it was, um, and the Union of Artists actually really thought of Francis Bacon in such great extreme, esteem, that he, they, they, which they only do for their own artists, they had these sort of columns with sort of statues on, which they covered with black cloth in respect to Francis Bacon, which is amazing to do that for a Western artist. In Russia? Though, in Russia, yeah. yeah. Did you ever have an argument with him? Never. Absolutely never. I mean, this is the extraordinary thing is, you know, people said he had a you know, vicious tongue, and, I'm, and I have seen his tongue on other people, and I've seen people cry, um, but he never, ever attacked me or have, a, or have an argument. I mean, however drunk one got. I mean, and in fact, thinking about drunkenness, there's one time... I was in Soho with him when the Colony Room was open up on a Saturday, and um, I, um, I think actually we've gone off for a Chinese meal around somewhere, which was I think Madame Ming's it was called, and um, and then went back to the Colony Room, and I actually fell asleep on the banquet, and then when I woke up, Ian Ball woke me up and said, "You've got to take Francis home." Anyway, Francis could hardly walk, so I sort of frog marched him down. We got a taxi, and on the on the way to South Ken. Um, there was his um, favourite restaurant, Mario's, this Italian restaurant. He said, let's stop there. So we went in there. And I remember we had the most delicious thing. It was spaghetti with sort of um, cream and spring onions, which sounds very boring. It was absolutely delicious. And I said, I remember trying to pay for the bill myself. In those days, you didn't have credit cards. You had a checkbook. Anyway, I did find this check. The other day, it was like, <laughs> that's because Francis paid in cash. But it's, um, Anyway, we tried to get a taxi. This was a Saturday night in uh, Brompton Cross, whatever, um, maybe it was 10.30. Couldn't get a taxi. So I frog-marched him home back to Reese Mews, which is not far, but it is quite far if you're very drunk. And then I 
got him home, got him upstairs, and then he said, well, should we have another drink? So we had some whiskey on top of whatever else. And then he started falling asleep. I said, Francis, I'm going. And he said, okay, I'll ring you tomorrow and let's have lunch. <laughs> anyway, I didn't have lunch. I think I sort of took about two days to recover. It seems extraordinary now, just because it's the constitution, both your constitution, for even to get through that one night. But um, that's nice you didn't argue. And so did you feel very sad when he died? Did you miss him? Was he friends enough? That you oh, no, yeah, definitely. And also, I mean, friends enough, so also but one of those people that you would bump into. And it, it wouldn't, you, wouldn't just, you wouldn't say hi. He'd say, like, what are you doing? Let's let's go to the Ritz for tea, or let's go for um, this Russian girl that I was living with, Elena. I bumped, we bumped into him in German Street, and he said, oh, you know, come, and have, um, come and have dinner at the Ritz. I said, I haven't got a tie. He said, oh, I'll buy you a tie. And I said, are you sure the Ritz is a good idea? We went to somewhere else, which was much better, because it's not so formal. And that was one of those things. He was sort of was so pleased to see you, he wouldn't, he wouldn't let you go. Yeah, and would he be nice to your friends, like you say he was? Yeah. He was delighted to meet uh, Elena. Um, I think he was fascinated, A, being Russian again, and um, she was a, was a very good-looking woman, and uh, sort of got, he was just sort of fascinated. And did any of, his other, uh, any of your other friends meet him with you? Um, yes, I mean, uh, when I had a gallery with Paul Conran, he, uh, he got on very well with Paul. Um, I was just trying to think. I mean, there was you know, lots of Patrick Cunningham, all sorts of people around at that time. Um, yeah. No, yes, he, he, he got on with them. And um, one question I always ask people is, if you could keep one of his paintings, which would it be? Wow. Wow. Um, I, strange enough, gosh, uh, that's quite a... Uh, well, I, without um, thinking about that, I, I, I don't know why, I quite like the one of him sort of leaning on something and, he's, and you get to see a big wristwatch. <laughs> I quite like that, I don't know why, I like it, but it's sort of quite funny. I think that's fine, mm -hmm. have that one. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it.